Okay, today we're going to be talking about a very interesting subject, uh, kind of an interesting thing here. Uh, before we get started, though, I want to just do two announcements quickly here, and that is uh, kind of an interesting thing here, just as a, a way of encouragement for those out there that, that have been listening for a while and that pray for this ministry. Every once in a while, I like to talk about a milestone that we reach in this ministry here. And I think the very first time I talked about a milestone, so to speak, was when we got a thousand downloads. Way, way back when, you know, it was like, we'll never get to a thousand downloads. Wow, we got to a thousand. <clears throat> and then there have been different times I've talked about other things there. But uh, this past week, for the very first time, we got 1,100 downloads in one week. So God is definitely... Uh, prospering the ministry and of course you know we don't make money from that or anything it's just a blessing to know that there are that many people tuning in 1100 sermon downloads in one week so thank you out there for those who are praying and you say well now you've made it we don't need to pray anymore no actually now you should pray harder <laughs> so that's a good thing the second thing I'd like to say and this is very interesting because it has very heavy prophetic implications and that is there have been some reports now that there are American troops being sent to Israel for a possible war with Iran, I guess is what the what people surmise from that. But there are American troops going to Israel. And that's very interesting if you know Bible prophecy because one of the things that's going to have to happen is the Dome of the Rock is going to have to be destroyed there in Jerusalem. And there are some say, well, no, they could build it someplace else, the temple, the rebuilt temple, which the Antichrist will eventually rule from. But I believe that there's going to be part of the thing of the peace that's brought in with the Antichrist is going to be that destruction of that Muslim Dome of the Rock. So it's very possible that that could be in the very near future. So that's kind of an exciting thing. Prophecy is coming to pass every day in the newspapers. We're getting very close to the return of the Lord, to the catching, or I should say, the catching away of the saints. So it's an exciting time to be alive. Now, Today's sermon is going to be about the coming underground house church. Uh, this is actually kind of an interesting thing. Uh, this doesn't happen very often, but this, I'll just tell you the situation here. Uh, about a month or two ago, I guess, I started having this idea for this thing of, you know, right now we have a house church here. We're not licensed or registered by the government. We do what we want to do. We speak what we want to speak because Jesus Christ is the head of this church. I'm the pastor here, but I'm not the head of the church. Jesus Christ is. And I'll point you to Jesus Christ, not to me. All right, now if you have a 501c3 church, the head of the, your church is not Jesus Christ. It's the federal government. Okay, they tell you what you can and cannot say, <clears throat> which is a very bad thing. And I, I started thinking about this and I thought, I wonder how long it's going to be till persecution comes to the churches and they have to go underground. And so that's what I'm going to talk about this morning. And the interesting thing is, I kind of thought about this, and I thought, well, it's, it's an interesting thought, but eh, I'll get around to it someday. And here, a brother from Germany, uh, I'll say his name here because he has written a book in German. You can probably look this up. His name is Wolfgang Lindenmeyer, and he wrote a book about underground house churches and starting an underground house church. And I never even heard of him before, and he sent me a copy of his book in German, and said, you know, you ought to read this and maybe you want to do a sermon on it. And it's just strange how God put a thought into my mind about doing an underground house church sermon and a, a guy I don't even know, a Christian I don't even know in Germany has already written a book and God has him contact me and say, hey, you ought to do a sermon. <laughs> Very interesting. <clears throat> Another interesting point I want to make is he sent me this book in German and, you know, I am... German-American, but I've been here for a long time, so I have no idea how to speak German. <laughs> and so I couldn't read the book. And so you have Google, they have the translate thing there. But the problem is Google Translate just does word-for-word -word translation. Now, I'm trying to make a point here as far as the King James Bible is concerned. You can't do word-for-word -word translation. Okay, there are certain, our word orders are different, and you have to put in words and things like that. Okay, so this this thing of, you know, it's not an accurate translation or whatever, you can't do word-for-word -word translation. 
And you say, well, then how do you know that the King James Bible is God's word? Well, because of the fruit that it bears. Again, I'm not going to go off on that, but it's just an interesting thing. Some people have this idea that you should be able to translate directly from one language to another. Not so. And we're going to go first to Proverbs chapter 22, verse 3. Now, a lot of people probably are going to say that this is a, you know, oh, you're paranoid. You're, you're talking about going underground and things really aren't that bad yet. Well, this is not about paranoia this morning. This is about preparedness. All right, if you can see some bad stuff coming, you know, you don't wait till the bad stuff gets there and then prepare. All right? Now, you know, the churches, I'll say this right up front, churches here in America... I can't speak so much for other countries, but churches here in America don't have to go underground yet. But I'm going to show you today that that time is coming. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 3 says here, A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. All right, that's a very important thing there. If you are a prudent man, you will foresee the evil, you'll see the storm clouds on the horizon. You know, and you will start to prepare yourself for that time that's coming. And the thing there about hiding himself, we're going to talk about that in this sermon. You basically have two options when persecution comes to the church. And that's number one, you can be martyred. Some Christians have chosen that. Or number two, you can hide yourself. And it doesn't mean that you're denying Jesus Christ if you decide to hide yourself to get out of the public view doesn't mean you're denying Jesus. It just simply means, hey, there are unjust, unjust laws out there. I'm not, I can't go out and, and be respected by some of these people, so I'm going to keep myself hidden from the public view. That's what we're going to be talking about today, the thing of the underground house church. Now, as I said, is persecution coming to the church? Well, right here we have the Associated Press... December 7th of 2011. This is, you know, what, a, a week or, or so ago? A week and one day, or I'm sorry, a month and one day ago. Gay rights are human rights. Obama, Clinton crack down on gay discrimination and say they will use foreign aid to improve LBGT rights abroad. I'm just going to read a couple quotes here and think about what's being said. The Obama administration bluntly warned the world against gay and lesbian discrimination. Uh, Hillary Clinton says here, quote, Religious traditions are no excuse for discrimination. Gay rights are human rights and human rights are gay rights, she said. It should never be a crime to be gay. What does the Bible say? They which commit such things are worthy of death. It was a crime. Here in America, even, we actually had anti-sodomy laws. And now, another thing she says here, quote, What was once justified as sanctioned by God, in other words, being anti-sodomite, is now properly reviled as an unconscionable violation of human rights. It's an unconscionable, it's reviled to be a Christian, a Bible-believing Christian, and say sodomy is of the devil. That it's an abomination in God's sake. That's reviled. And unconscionable. That's what she says. Another quote here from Obama this time. The struggle to end discrimination against lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender persons is a global challenge and one that is central to the United States' commitment to promoting human rights, Mr. Obama said in a statement. So there you have this thing of it's not just anymore, hey, it's an alternate lifestyle, and if somebody wants to do that, that's fine. You know, don't discriminate them. They're now saying that it's human rights. And they're, they're trying to make it into a crime to speak against sodomy. And, you know, I was watching a video last night about uh, Brother Greg Miller put it together about the thing of the rise in sodomy is showing that we are very close to the end. Because the Bible talks about time and time again about how it was in the days of Noah. But in the book of Luke, it actually talks about the days of Lot, how it was in Sodom and Gomorrah. And how that, that, when it gets like that, then the return of the Lord is going to be close. Well, we're right there. That's how bad things are getting. They're actually going to start making it a crime to speak against sodomites. 
And, you know, another thing I just want to say, another uh, article I saw this past week, these radical sodomites are actually starting to go to these 501c3 churches and stand outside with bullhorns and scream and yell things. And they're going into these 501c3 churches and they're making problems. It's only a matter of time before they start to say, you are not allowed to preach against sodomy. I'm going to talk about that more in just a minute here. Another big thing that happened, New Year's Eve, our fabulous dictator signed the bill, the North, um, I'm sorry, the what is it here? National Defense Authorization Act, the NDAA, whereby the military can now be used to arrest American citizens and put them in detention camps without trial, and they can put them in indefinitely. The president signed it into law, and it's for American citizens. They claim, oh, it's not for citizens, it's only for illegal aliens. No, it isn't. It's for citizens. And Here's an article on it. You can look it up. Mike Adams, Natural News, January 2, 2012. I mean, it's just incredible. And they now have laws in the military, our military, where you're not allowed to discriminate, discriminate against sodomites and other perverse groups, which I'm not going to say here because I don't want to defile people's minds. What's my point? My point is we are turning into a very, um, very bad <laughs> country. I mean, we already had our problems, but things are going to get worse and worse. And you see, you say, what's this have to do with the churches and having to have an underground house church? Well, I've said it in other studies. I'll say it one more time. A lot of people don't know about this. A 501c3 church is officially government property. When you go down the road and you see these church buildings and things, most of them are under Section 501c3 of the U.S. IRS tax code. And what that does, when you put yourself underneath that, you basically are giving your property, property over to the government. And the government dictates what is said and what is not said. And they say in the 501c3 legislation, you are not allowed to speak against public policy or do anything to affect public policy. Now, they're starting to say, we need to do something to stop discrimination of sodomy. They're getting close to passing laws. So what's going to happen in the future? You're going to have the government's going to come out and they're going to say, okay, churches, this is what you're going to preach. And you're going to have a lot of Christians saying, oh, no, we're not. We're not going to preach that. And the government says, yes, you will. You have no right to do that. Well, actually, yes, we do. You see, because back in the 1960s, we got all you guys on our tax code 501c3, and now we control you. And if you don't speak what we tell you to speak, not only are we going to come and shut your church down, we're going to imprison you. And they will have a legal right to do that. Or if you want to you know, say legal, I mean, they're passing these laws, it's ridiculous. But they have it on paper that they can now shut these places down and imprison the pastors. And what's going to happen when that happens? the real true Christians are going to have to go underground. Now, is that going to happen before the rapture? I don't know. I can't say that. But it is going to happen at some point in time. Go to Revelation chapter 13. common thing that you, a lot of people will say when they meet someone who professes to be a Christian, they'll say, where do you folks worship at? Now, what do they mean by that? They mean, when they say, where do you worship at? What they're saying is, where do you go to church? What church building do you go to? Where do you fellowship? Where do you worship at? Now, is this system of worship, is it, is it only for Christians? No. Look at verse 11 here in Revelation chapter 13. Revelation 13, 11. It says here, and I beheld another beast coming out, up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them that which and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, 
that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many would not as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Very familiar passage there about the Antichrist. And really, I mean, you could read the whole chapter there, Revelation 13, and you'll see this thing again and again of the coming Antichrist, who's called the beast. He's likened unto a beast there. Obviously, he's not going to be some animal, but he's likened to that. It's speaking uh, figuratively here. But this beast is worshipped. Now, where do you worship? You worship in church buildings. Okay, this, this coming system of the antichrist this new world order that's coming it's going to be a system of worship it's very interesting and it says about there that the image he's going to give the false prophet gives life to the image you know and that these people are to worship the image what do you have in most modern mega churches huge big tv screens the antichrist every sunday morning could stand up and give an address to all the world and the and the people in those big Modern churches could be worshiping him. You say, what about the mark of the beast there? Buying and selling with the mark of the beast. A lot of these big mega churches, they already have cashless giving. They have giving kiosks where you can go and you can put your Mac card in or whatever, your bank card, bank visa. They have that. They have it. They can auto automatically deduct it from your bank account. The system is in place. It's already there. You know, and, and you could say a whole lot more about this Antichrist system already being in the modern churches. But the, the point I wanted to make there is this coming Antichrist system is not you're going to have to you know, go and pledge allegiance to him and, and out in you know, some public place. It's a system of worship. Worship is done in church buildings. And that's where it's going to happen in the future. So what are true Christians going to have to do? Well, true Christians are going to be leaving at the rapture which is not very far off. So this sermon is for if persecution comes before the rapture, but hopefully this might survive and might actually get to some of the tribulation saints that are left here after the rapture that don't want to be part of the Mark of the Beast system. And at that point in time, they will not have an option. They're going to have to be underground. You know, there's a whole different dynamic there in that tribulation time period. I mean, right now, you can witness to anybody. You know, you see some guy with tattoos and earrings and whatever else, you can witness to him. In the tribulation time period, somebody has the mark of the beast, you can't witness to him. They're lost. Done. Chance is over. So it's a totally different dynamic. And in that, that tribulation time period, it's not about so much about evangelism, it's going to be about survival. All right Now, there will be martyrs in that time period, but... You know, you're going to have to weigh that stuff out. Now, as I said earlier, you're basically going to have two, two choices if this thing comes of hate crime laws. They're already on the books. There are already Christians that are being persecuted by this. Uh, but it's not really being strictly enforced yet on all the church buildings. But if this comes before the rapture, you're going to have two choices. Okay, martyrdom or go underground. That's your only two choices. So we're going to look first at martyrdom. Turn to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 5. We're going to see some very interesting things here. Book of Acts. Acts chapter 5, verse 17 is where we're going to go. This, you can learn a lot from what was going on in the book of Acts, how the Lord was doing things and, and working things. It says here in Acts chapter 5, verse 17, Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation. Basically, you had Peter and John there. They were out preaching, and these... Jewish leaders were out there listening to them and they were filled with indignation. They were very mad. Verse 18, 
and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. Now look at this. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. Well, it doesn't look like the Lord had much respect for the political and religious authorities back then. I mean, can you, can you imagine people, you know, the, this modern Christian mindset of who Jesus was, just this peacemaker? And right here he is, you know, the angel of the Lord there. I believe that's a, a manifestation of Jesus Christ. And he comes down and he breaks these, these Christians out of prison. And the reason they were put in prison is because they were speaking in the temple and the leaders got mad. Jesus goes and busts them out of prison and says, hey, go back to that temple. Go back and preach. Well, that's not very nice, is it? I mean, that's you shouldn't be doing that. That's just making trouble. Yep, pretty much so. Jump down to verse 25. And, you know, in the 21 through 24 there, they, they're coming and they're saying, hey, they're not in the prison. What's going on? Verse 25. Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom ye put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. <laughs> That's where they're at. Verse 26. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. That's interesting. Verse 27. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, or asked them, saying, Did we not... Or did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. That's an interesting statement there that they made. Because bringing the blood of Jesus on you is what forgives your sins. That's not what they meant. They were meaning, you're, you're trying to you know, make us the ones that are guilty of this of killing this man, of killing Jesus Christ. And of course they were. Verse 29 then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Hmm. Interesting statement there. We ought to obey God rather than men. There are going to be times when men tell you to do something and God tells you to do something else. You know, what I talked about earlier. Hillary Clinton and Obama, the rulers, the appointed authorities of our land, they have said that discrimination against sodomites is wrong. It's a terrible thing. It's, it should be reviled. It's a horrible thing. But what's God say? God says it's an abomination. And you're not to have anything to do with it. So who are you going to follow? Who are you going to submit to? Verse 38. Now they basically are trying to figure out, you know, should we kill these guys and everything? Verse 38 here. Uh, this learned Dr. Gamaliel stands up and he's the one speaking here. He says here, And now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone, for if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest haply ye be found even to fight against God. And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. They didn't care what the political authorities, the political and religious authorities told them. They did what God told them to do. Even though they were commanded. Now go to Acts chapter 6, verse 5. We're going to see some more interesting things here. Okay, it says here, And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. You have to remember this is still that transition time, where they had signs that were confirming the word of the Jews. Okay, You're not going to see the, the great wonders and miracles today. 
verse 9. Now look at this again. Now, let me just say this before we continue. Back there in Acts chapter 5, they sent the captains and things and stuff and took them without violence because they feared the people. You see, the people wanted to hear the preaching. The common people out there, they wanted to hear it. And who was it that persecuted them? It was the religious leaders. Look what happens again here, verse 9. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians and Alexandrians, hmm, which is where your new versions come from, Alexandria, Egypt, Alexandrians and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Notice the wisdom came from the spirit by which he spake, not from his own wisdom. Verse 11, Then they suburned men which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council looking steadfastly on him saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Now that is an, an extremely interesting and telling thing right there that we just read. Verse fifth, or I'm sorry, verse thirteen, set up false witnesses. Did you know that that's what will happen to you if you're a Bible believing Christian? The lost world will set up false witnesses, and look what they charge him with. Verse fourteen, we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place. So what are they charging him with? What would that be called if you if you had somebody today and they said that guy over there, that Bible believing Christian? He said he's going to destroy this place. What would that be in our modern language? Terrorist. Terrorist. Exactly. They would say, it's a terrorist thing. He's going to do something violent. And if you've heard my one message on the, the poster of rapture thieves, I think it's either part two or three, there's a Greek Orthodox priest and he says pre-rapture believers could actually do something violent. He actually says it. I mean, he, I have the recording. The guy says that you know they, it could lead them to do something violent. See, that's what they're doing. And see, they'll say, "Oh, you, you're discriminating discriminating against gays, against the the sodomites out there, and you're probably going to do something violent. You're a terrorist." See, it's the same thing. The religious leaders, these lost liberals here in of verse nine, bring these charges and accusations against a Bible believer. Why? Because they can't answer him. And there's a lot of these guys out there that can't answer us as King James Bible believers. And so all that's left to do is just bring up false witnesses and, and charge us with trying to do something violent. See? It's the same thing. It's, it's repeating itself. But it's interesting too that Stephen disputed publicly with them. He didn't go in private and say, well, you know, I don't want to name names or anything. He disputed publicly. Very interesting. So then what happened? Well, you can go through Acts chapter 7 where Stephen gets in some good preaching to him. And after the sermon, <laughs> verse 54, When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed, him with, gnashed on him with their teeth. And you'll see that too. You can get some of these religious, you know, fake religious people so mad that they'll just say, I just can't stand you. You, you Bible believer. They'll, see what they're doing? They're clenching their teeth and they will gnash on you with their teeth. Very interesting. Verse 55, But he being full of the Holy Ghost looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. <laughs> oh boy. Verse 57, Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city, and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Stephen was calling upon God. They weren't. Verse 60, And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, 
Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. There's the account of the very first Christian martyr. But it's interesting. What did they charge Stephen with? Wanted to do something violent. What did they do? <laughs> something violent. Isn't that interesting? Oh, you Christians out there, you're discriminating the, the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender people. But what are you going to do about it? We're going to put you in a camp and torture you. <laughs> it's like, um, you know, we're supposed to be the hateful ones, the ones that are, are killing and torturing and terrorists and whatever, and yet they, by their actions, are the true terrorists. Not much changes. All right? Very interesting. Now, you know, is this going to have to be the future of some Christians? I don't know. I have no idea. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10 says, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. I think that's definitely going to be true for tribulation saints, but it could come to Christians before the rapture. I don't know. Now, what about hiding or running from martyrdom? If you remember the verse we started out with there in Proverbs, it talked about a prudent man foreseeing the evil and hiding himself. Now that's something that you need to, to keep in mind. That might be a, another option for you. You know, I mean, I'm kind of a, a known figure. I mean, I'm not world famous or anything, but it's not like I can pretend that I'm not a preacher. You know, my sermons are out there. They'd have enough evidence to convict me pretty easily. <laughs> but some of you out there that are listening that aren't in public ministry, that's something that you're going to have to think about. If they say no more sodomy, no more preaching against sodomy, well, you can go out, you know, and stand on the street corner and proclaim that sodomites are wicked and whatever, and they can haul you off to a camp someplace, or you can decide to hide yourself. And you got to keep that in mind. It's not a bad thing. Uh, Acts chapter nine. Acts chapter nine, verse. 19. Acts chapter 9, verse 19. We're going to read a couple verses here. We read about Saul there, that the coats were laid at Saul's feet. Saul becomes Paul here in Acts chapter 9. Okay, here we're reading verse 19. Uh, Saul gets saved by Ananias comes in and prays for him and things, and he's filled with the Holy Ghost, receives his sight. Um, verse 19, And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Let me stop there for just a second. There's this thing among, especially among some of the independent Baptists, that you have to go through a time of, of education and training and everything before you can witness for Jesus Christ. I don't agree with that. There is a sense in which you should study as a Christian. That should be there. But I don't believe this thing of you have to wait for a couple years before you qualify to, to go out and tell somebody how to be saved. I don't agree with that. And you see Paul right there. Straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues. Okay? Verse 21. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. Part of your education as a Christian is going to be on the battlefield, so to speak. Going out and witnessing to people and they'll give you questions that you can't answer. And you go back and you get the answers to that question and then you're ready for that the next time it comes up. Okay, Verse 23, And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. You know, they're doing violence again. Verse 24, But, they, but their laying await was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Now did Paul go out there and, I'm going to preach to these people and if they want to attack me and martyr me that's fine is that what he did no verse 25 then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket that's a very interesting thing there 
Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to see it again here. He talks about it. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 32 and 33. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 32. It says here, In Damascus the governor under Aretas the king kept the city of the Damascenes with a garrison desirous to apprehend me. And through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hands. Notice it was the governor there. It wasn't just a couple of the Jews that you know got together and wanted to, to hurt him. It was actually the governmental authority that was actually trying to kill him. And he escaped his hands. He said, well, then Paul lived to be an old man, lived at an old age and everything, and died in a nice happy retirement home or something. No. Paul was eventually martyred, but you don't have to be martyred right away. It you know, might not be, you know, and if there's a way to escape, and the Lord provides a way to get out of a thing, you know, if, if persecution comes and the churches have to go underground, do it. And if you can do it, if you can just get off the radar, so to speak, you know, get off the radar. Okay, we'll continue here. What about Jesus? Is there any stories about Jesus? Did he always just openly stand up and never back down? Luke chapter 4. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. Okay, everybody there? Luke chapter 4, verse 16 says, And he came to Nazareth, uh, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Notice it says there, he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. Now, we would call that today your hometown. So he came home. That's where the, the people knew who he was. They, oh, this is Jesus, you know. Welcome back, Jesus. Nice to see you, whatever. <laughs> he came there to Nazareth. Uh, jump down to verse 24. Here he's trying to preach to them, and they aren't accepting it. Verse 24, Jesus says to him, And he said, Verily I say unto you, No prophet is accepted in his own country. Now you'll notice that. If you're a Christian and you're trying to Speak the truth to your family, to your friends, to the place where you grew up. They won't respect you many times. Most of the people that respect me are in other states or other countries. Not so much around here. That's just the way the thing works. Now look at verse 28. We're going to see what happens here. All And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. Remember what happened with Stephen? Same thing here. Verse 29, and, he, and rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him unto the brow of the hill whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way and came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. Another place in Scripture talks about his word was he spake as one with authority and not as the scribes. A scribe will cast doubt on what he's reading so that the authority will go on him. Okay, a Bible believer will not do that. I'm going to give this book the authority. And I'm going to tell you this is what the Lord says, thus saith the Lord. Not a better translation would be. That's the way a scribe speaks. All right, but you see there, look at that reaction. His hometown got mad at what he was saying, and they grabbed him, and they took him up, and they were going to throw him off a cliff. And he didn't say, okay, this is my time, I'm just going to be martyred. No. He, through the confusion, he kind of just walked through the crowd, you know, kind of probably hit his face, and <laughs> and he got out of there. Took off. Kind of interesting. Matthew chapter 21. We'll go there next. Now the question comes up, uh, why were the religious leaders so much against Jesus and the Christians? I mean, what was the big deal? Why didn't they just respect them and just, you know, appreciate the fact that they, you know, you have your beliefs, we have our beliefs. Why not? What we're going to see here in Matthew chapter 21, verse 
23 through 27. And again, you're going to see that this is the exact same thing that goes on today. It's interesting how little things change. Matthew chapter 21 verse 23 says, And when he was come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, Now look at this, By what authority doest thou these things, and who gave thee this authority? Well, that's a very interesting thing there. Because I've been asked that. By what authority do you have to have that house church there? Are you a licensed, ordained pastor? See? It's the same thing. Verse 24. And Jesus answered and said unto them, I also will ask you one thing, which if ye tell me, I and likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, whence was it? From heaven or of men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, Why did ye not then believe him? But if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for all had John as a prophet. And they answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. And he said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. Interesting thing there. Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. We'll go back. We were here in Acts chapter 4 reading about this before, but I'm going to show you a little bit more detail here. Here you have Peter and John, and they're out preaching. Acts chapter 4, verse 5. Okay, it says here, And it came to pass on the morrow that their, el their rulers and elders and scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. All the big shots were there. You know, it'd be kind of like an ecumenical meeting today where you'd have the Pope and you'd have the uh, Archbishop and you'd have the, you know, the head of the Orthodox Church and you'd have the head of the Episcopalian Church and the independent baptist or the american baptists or southern baptists or you know united methodists and all these big shots they all gathered together verse 7 and when they had set them in the midst they asked by what power or by what name have ye done this isn't that interesting <laughs> whose authority do you have we didn't you know we didn't we none of us licensed you to go out and preach this isn't your diocese you know how, what right do you have to be here it's very interesting. And by the way, that's one of the reasons a lot of Christians came here to America. Because over in Europe, after they cast off the Catholic Church back in the Reformation, the Protestant churches that took over were licensing their preachers. Okay, The King of England was having his preachers officially ordained and licensed. And what was happening is you'd have Christians that would go out and preach the gospel, and they were being beaten and imprisoned. John Bunyan is a good example of that. He said, I'm not taking a license from the government. And that's what a lot of the early Christians were. They wouldn't take a license. Okay, now look at verse 13. There in Acts chapter 4. It says here, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. You know the two things that are going to be hurled at you if you're not a licensed, ordained preacher? They'll say you're unlearned and you're ignorant. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? I've had that a couple times put on me. What are your credentials? Well, it doesn't, what does it matter? I'm showing you what the Bible says here. If I'm wrong, then use Scripture to prove me wrong. You don't say, well, you don't have a degree. You know, you're not a Ph.D., you know, you know. That, that's not the way it works. It's not well, what power, what authority, what license, you know, who licensed you to be here? That isn't it. That's man-made religion. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Look at verse 15. Okay, it says here, But when they, go, when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly 
threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right or in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. He didn't say, we're going to do that. He just said, you guys judge it. <laughs> of course it isn't. Verse 20, For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. So the only reason that they didn't punish him is because the people were praising the Lord as a, as a result of this. Now, we're going to look at a couple more verses here and then we're going to be done this morning. The question comes up, is it ever okay to lie to political authorities? Some people would say no. But I'm going to show you what the Bible says. Exodus chapter 1. Go way back in the Old Testament. Your first book in the Bible is Genesis. Then the second book is Exodus. Exodus chapter 1. We're going to look at verse 15. If tyranny comes, and tyranny is here actually, but if tyranny starts to come to the to the Christian churches, you might be faced with a situation similar to what we're going to be reading here. It's kind of interesting because we're going to be reading about Pharaoh commanding to kill babies, and it's interesting because in China right now they actually have that system. They have forced abortion in China. Reading here, Exodus chapter 1, verse 15. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of the one was Shipra, and the name of the other was Pua. And he said, When ye do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women, and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then ye shall kill him, but if it be a daughter, then she shall live. Now, that's a pretty horrible thing to say to a midwife. There aren't too many midwives that would want to carry that out. And especially you have him saying to the Hebrew midwives when you're there giving, you know, delivering a Hebrew child. He didn't say it about the Egyptians. He just said it about the Hebrew children. Now look at verse 17. But the midwives feared God. Remember what we read there in the book of Acts? We ought to obey God rather than men. But the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. Hmm. Very interesting. Now what did they what happens here? Verse 18. And the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said unto them, Why have ye done this thing and have saved the men children alive? Pharaoh found out. <laughs> Verse 19. And the midwives said unto Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively and are delivered ere the midwives come in unto them. Is that true? No. That was a lie. I mean, give me a break. You know, oh, we heard about this woman going into labor, but before we could get there, the baby's out. That doesn't work. Come on. You know, <laughs> that's ridiculous. And even if it was true, they could still kill the baby when they get there. So what did they do? They lied to Pharaoh. Look at verse 20. Therefore God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. And continuing here, verse 21, And it came to pass because the midwives feared God that he made them houses. God blessed them for lying to the corrupt politician. Isn't that interesting? A lot of people have this idea that you should never lie, you should always tell the truth, and you should, but when you have a tyrant, you know, go, to, go back to Nazi Germany. Here come the Nazis. Bang on the door. You go over to the door and they say, Do you have any Jews in your home? We've come to take them to the camps. And you got two families down in the basement. Are you going to hang your head and say, Yes, actually. I have two families down in the basement, some with little children. Go down and take them. Thank you for telling the truth, you know. <laughs> of course not. Nazis come to the door, they say, Do you have any Jews in your house? Jews? What? A Jew? I don't, I don't know. I don't think I've ever seen one. <laughs> You know, same thing as if, you know, some guy holds you up at gunpoint on the street and he says, give me all your money. And then you take your wallet out and you go, oh, great, here you go. You know, here's my money. Now, do you have anything else? 
And in your other pocket over here, you have a gold coin, one ounce gold coin. Which I don't know too many people that would do that, but I'm just trying to make a point. But you say, yes, I have a gold coin in my other pocket. And in fact, I have a vault at home with lots of silver and gold bullion and uh, $5,000 in cash. Follow me to the house and I'll give you all that I have. <laughs> no, you don't do that. Why? Because you're dealing with a criminal. You're dealing with somebody that's no good. In the future, if this stuff comes, if this, if this happens and somebody says, I saw a lot of people up at your house last night. Are you holding some kind of church meeting there? Church meeting? What? No, I don't know. It wasn't a church meeting. We just get together and play games. <laughs> play board games. Don't tell them the truth. Why? Because they're a terror to good works. Let's see about that. Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, verse 1. There's a lot of false teaching on this, and especially if you go to a 501c3 church. I've been in quite a few of them over the years, and I've heard this text preached on three different times, and all of them skip certain verses. They will not define the rulers, the powers that are ordained of God. They will not define them. Romans chapter 13, verse 1. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Did God ordain Hitler? Yes. He did. Okay? Why? Because the German people were decadent and wicked. Did God ordain Obama? Yes. I hate to say it, but God put him in there. Why? Because the American people are wicked. You look at Germany, Nazi Germany, before Hitler came to power, they were doing all, there was all kinds of perversion and all kinds of drunken parties and stuff like that. And you look at America before Obama came to power and before all these other, you know, evil people came to power, it's the same stuff going on. God will allow these evil men to come in. But now let's continue here. Verse 2. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Now what they'll do is they'll skip this next verse. Verse 3. Here the ruler is defined. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. In the text here, in the context, the thing of being subject to the ruler, to the higher power, it's a good ruler, a good higher power. Why? Because they're not a terror to good people. They will actually praise those that are doing good. That's what, who is being defined here. Verse 4, For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. So you have there the definition. A ruler, a real ruler that you're to be subject to, is not a terror to you if you're a good Christian. But when they become a terror to you, when it's now the criminals that are protected and the good people that are attacked, you have no responsibility to that ruler. Just as the early Christians there, they were going out and preaching and the rulers of the people were saying, you're not allowed to do that. And the Christians were saying, hey, we're going we're gonna to follow God and not you. When Pharaoh came along, if Pharaoh would have said, hey, you know, do a good job delivering all the children and things like that. If he had said that to the midwives, they should have obeyed him. But when, Her when Pharaoh came along and he said to the Hebrew midwives, I want you to kill those children, the male Hebrews, those midwives had to say, our God says that that's wrong. We're not going to do it. All right? Now we're going to go to one more place here. 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. I'm going to show you what, uh, what the Lord wants as far as our relationship to political authorities. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Okay, it says here, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, 
for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. God wants us to be honest. He wants us to not have to lie. But why? what is the condition for that? We may lead a quiet and peaceable life. See, when things are not quiet and peaceable, then you can no longer be honest. Unfortunately. If you're dealing with criminals, you can't be honest with them. But that's what God's will is for us. And you should pray for peace. You should say, I want I, I don't want to live and, and have to live in a violent situation or disobey the government or whatever else. You know, people say, oh, you're anti-government because you speak against the government. I'm not anti-government. And Christians should not be anti-government. We should be against tyranny and tyrannical government. When they start to take away our rights, our God-given rights and our God-given duty to preach against sin, we have to turn against them. That's very important. Uh, a couple points here. Some thoughts for the coming underground church. Uh, some of this is my own um, thoughts on it, and some of this, actually a lot of this, I actually got from the brother that wrote the book there in Germany. Uh, first of all, when the churches go corrupt, the 501c3 churches, when they go corrupt, true Christians are going to need to worship away from public view. All right, you aren't going to be able to, I mean, this house church here, where there's no sign down at the end of the road saying, or down at the road there, saying uh, Bible Believers Fellowship, all are welcome. You can't do that. And there are a lot of scriptures in the Bible. You know, the church has never been to evangelize the lost. You never, it's never been a thing as, let me clarify that, it's never been a thing where we build a building and the lost come into it to get saved. That's never been God's design. God's design is for the church to come together, to fellowship together, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, you know, uh, the purpose of the church is to come together to study, to learn, to go out to the lost and get them saved and then bring them into the church. So this modern teaching of the church, but well, where are people supposed to go to get saved? Well, Christians are supposed to go out to them. People act like a house church is somehow wrong because we don't invite the lost in. Uh, that's never been God's design. And it's especially going to be true when you have the laws of the land saying it's illegal to preach against sodomy and to preach against, you know, whatever else. Other religions even. You know, I've even seen that, that hate crime is preaching against other religions. They're just trying to take away our rights, our freedom. Secondly, service times are going to have to vary from week to week so a pattern does not become visible. If the churches have to go underground, if you have to meet away from public view... Don't hold your service from 9 to 12 every Sunday morning. That's a bad idea. Sometimes it'll be Friday night. Sometimes it'll be Tuesday, Tuesday afternoon. Sometimes Saturday morning. Sometimes Sunday evening. Some, mix it up. Okay? And you say, well, well, how on earth could we do that? I mean, how would we signal to do this stuff? I mean, would we put it out on our website or something? <laughs> no. Websites and any kind of thing like that's not a good idea. I'll get more into that here in just a minute. Uh, the third thing, and this is interesting because I, I studied this issue and this brother in Germany actually had this stuff in his book. And I thought, you know, that's pretty incredible. Uh, number three, certain signs and symbols can be used to announce service times and or locations. Now we're talking about a totally tyrannical, throwing Christians in prison kind of a system here. Right now this isn't necessary. Right now, we still have the ability to talk openly about our services and people can come and visit. You know, that's fine. But in the future, if we'll say, you know, the church meets together, they're fellowshipping together, and they say, okay, uh, we're going to try to have the service on Thursday night. And if that's okay, Thursday morning, we'll park our red car down by the road there with a white piece of cloth or something in the window to look like it's, you know, broke down or something like that. See, you signal things like that. Or you'll say, we're, you know, if, if the service is on, if it's okay, we'll hang some wash out on the front porch. We'll hang our, this specific rug over the railing. And then the people drive by at some point during the day and they say, okay, service is on. And if it's not hanging there, 
Or if there's a red thing hanging there or something, well, okay, then it's off. You know, you're, I mean, we're talking about total tyranny where you have to hide from the evil people in authority. And in the tribulation, this is going to come into full manifestation. You're going to have to use these, these systems. Okay, and on that note, no electronic communication. That's all tracked. I'm going to be talking about that this coming week. I'm going to be doing a, another message here. But electronic communication can be tracked and traced very easily. I read a story in this, in this brother's book from Germany about a woman in North Korea that they were a house church. And she messed up. She was on the phone. And this woman that she was talking to was another member of the house church. And they were talking about the weather and about, you know, shopping and getting a good deal at such and such a store. And this one woman, she said, I'm just kind of feeling sick. You know, I'm not, not feeling all that good. And the other woman said, well, I'll be praying for you. See ya. Hung up the phone. Within an hour, she was arrested and taken to a camp. Within an hour. That's what it's like to live under tyranny. And see, right now, this stuff seems parano you know, kind of paranoia and stuff to, to people in English-speaking countries. But you go to China... Or you go to North Korea or some of these places, or Pakistan or some places like that, this stuff is already being practiced. They're already being persecuted. Uh, another very important thing, right now, in a time when there's really no persecution, real, no real persecution right now for us, right now is the time to stock up on King James Bibles, books, audio sermons, etc. Right, that stuff eventually could become illegal. In the tribulation, it will definitely be illegal. Revelation chapter 6 talks about people being killed for the word of God, as well as for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So right now, if you want to get some good sermons off of the internet, now's the time to do it. You might not have that chance in the future. Okay? Uh, we actually have ours now. The first 150 sermons are now available on an audio DVD. You can contact us if you're interested in that. But the point is, right now is the time to stock up on that stuff. Uh, another point here. Tracting will take on a new danger. Okay? <laughs> you aren't going to be just able to walk around and give out tracks and stuff. Uh, unmarked tracks are going to be required. You can't say, contact us, you know, so and so. I mean, I'd just take the authorities right to you. And you're going to have to be careful. If this time comes, you're going to have to be careful about tracting because a lot of places have video surveillance. So they can get you on video. It's tough to think about. Martyrdom or hiding yourself when the evil comes. Something to think about there. And just kind of an interesting story I want to read here quick. This is a book about the Waldensian people, the Waldenses of northern Italy. I'm going to read you something here, kind of give you some ideas. It says here, to maintain the truth in their own mountains was not the only object of this people. They felt their relations to the rest of Christendom. They sought to drive back the darkness and reconquer the kingdom which Rome had overwhelmed. They were an evangel evangelistic as well as an evangelical church. Now this, is, by the way, is during the Dark Ages. This isn't modern times. This is during the Dark Ages when the Roman Catholic Church controlled everything. It says here, it was an old law among them that all who took orders in their church should, before being eligible to a home charge, serve three years in the mission field. The youth on whose head the assembled barbes lay their hands saw in prospect not a rich benefice, but a possible martyrdom. Now the barbes were the Italian word basically for like a, you know, uh, a man that was a preacher, an elder, essentially. So the elders, when they would get a young man that wanted to be in ministry, they would lay their hands on him before they would send him out into the mission field. And they'd say, we're going to send you out for three years, you and your partner, two, two young men, you'll go out in pairs, as they did in the Bible. Remember we read about Peter and John earlier? We're going to send you out, and if you survive, <laughs> you know, and make it back in three years, then you can become an elder yourself. <laughs> kind of a tough thing. It says here, the ocean they did not cross. Their mission field was the realms that lay outspread at the foot of their own mountains. They went forth two and two, concealing their real character under the guise of a secular profession, most commonly that of merchants or peddlers. 
Hmm, interesting. They carried silks, jewelry, and other articles at that time not easily purchasable, save at distant marts, and they were welcomed as merchants where they had would have been spurned as missionaries. Very interesting. The door of the cottage and the portal of the bar, baron's castle stood equally open to them, but their address was mainly shown in selling without money and without price, rarer and more valuable merchandise than the gems and silks which had procured them entrance. They took care to carry with them, concealed among their wares or about their persons, portions of the word of God, their own transcription commonly, and to this they would draw the attention of the inmates. Let me just tell you what that means there. This is obviously before they had printing presses. So they would take their Bible and they would write out portions of Scripture. They'd write out verses. And then they would carry these transcripts with them. And then they'd be saying, oh, you see this fine silk here and this fine cloth? Oh, and by the way here, here's something that's very interesting to read. The Bible says here, or, you know, this. look at this. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You know, and they'd read that. And if the people were interested, then that would open up the conversation and they would be able to witness to them. And if they'd say, where would you get that? Where'd you get that? Oh, I just kind of found it, you know. <laughs> and then they'd go back to selling the silk. So it was a very wise thing that they would do. Continuing here just a little bit more. When they saw a desire to possess it, they would freely make a gift of it where the means of purchase were absent. In other words, if people wanted to buy these verses of Scripture, they'd say... Just go ahead and take it. It's yours. There was no kingdom of southern and central Europe to which these missionaries did not find their way, and when they did not leave traces of their visit in the dis disciples whom they made. On the west they penetrated into Spain. In southern France they found congenial fellow laborers in the Albigenses, by whom the seeds of truth were plentifully scattered over Dauphine and Languedoc. On the east descending the Rhine and the Danube, they leavened Germany, Bohemia, and Poland with their doctrines, their track being marked with the edifices for worship and the stakes of martyrdom that, around, that arose around their steps. Even the seven-hilled city they feared not to enter. They went into Rome, into Vatican City back in the Dark Ages, the very citadel of, of Satan back then. They actually went in there. Scattering the seed on ungenial soil, if perchance some of it might take root and grow, their naked feet and coarse woolen garments made them somewhat marked figures in the streets of a city that clothed itself in purple and fine linen, and when their real errand was discovered as sometimes chanced, the rulers of Christendom took care to further in their own way the springing of the seed by watering it with the blood of the men who had sowed it. Okay, so in other words, sometimes they were martyred, sometimes they got away with it. You know, if you went out and you got martyred, well, you don't get to become an elder then. <laughs> and, you know, that's going to have to be the way it'll be in the future. Now, a couple more points here and then we're done. In the time of Jacob's trouble, which is coming, and I referred to this earlier, witnessing will not be possible to those who have taken the mark. Salvation will be more about survival in that time. That's why you read in Matthew twenty four thirteen. it says about enduring to the end and that you'll be saved. You're going to have to endure to the end if you make it into that time of Jacob's trouble. The only people that will make it into that are those who have rejected Jesus Christ. Uh, number eight. Remember that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego all survived under the tyrannical dictatorship of Nebuchadnezzar. Their loyalty was put to the test, but they survived and, in fact, thrived. You read about Daniel. He was actually a wealthy man. Not because he compromised, but because he stood his ground and God delivered him through that time. So that's another possibility. Uh, we must be open to God's leading right now, but we must never compromise. So, in conclusion, let me just say, start preparing right now. Hopefully we will be able to continue preaching in peace until the rapture. That's what I hope. But if the time comes when they say you can't speak against sodomy, well, you're going to have to weigh it out. Martyrdom or hiding yourself. So that's going to be it for this morning. And I thank you for listening, and I pray that you will be open to the Lord's leading for the future. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. 
If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA, 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.